The following is a local resident producer's program. The program content is the sole responsibility of the producer and does not necessarily reflect the views or policies of CATV2, Oshkosh Community Media Services, the City of Oshkosh, or Time Warner Cable. In Oshkosh, Dan Rylance here, along with the chief of the city of Oshkosh Police Department, Scott Groyle, um, a long-awaited um, guest appearance by him. We've been trying to get you on for, um, I think, about six weeks now to talk about the urban deer issue, and your schedule didn't mesh with ours, and but uh, we're finally all together and very happy to have you here. So thanks. This is his second appearance. It is. Yes. yes. So, but anyway, we appreciate your, your being yeah, here tonight. Well, well, I appreciate um, the invitation, and it's a pleasure. Tearing yourself away from Johnny Depp duty. So. <laughs> <laughs> Um, anyway, we do want to touch on a few other things later on, mm -hmm. but the main reason why we'd asked you here was uh, the urban deer issue. Mm -hmm. um, of, of probably about four weeks ago, I guess, three weeks ago, we had on a couple of um, neighbors who live in the Huntington Downs area. I don't know if you happen to see that show or not, but they um, were very knowledgeable about what's going on with the urban deer issue. Mm -hmm. um, they've certainly, I guess you could call them victims of the urban deer problem. Mm -hmm you know, with damage to their property and shrubs or what have you. And um, so they've been working, I think, pretty closely with everyone involved. And, um, you know, just to kind of help Chief, the audience understand how, because when I think of deer, and deer management, I think of, you know, um, the DNR, I think, maybe in a lesser view of our parks director, how did the Chief of Police come to be involved in this issue? Well, that's a that's a very good question, and, and it, it really is a, a multifaceted approach. Um, how the police got involved is there are uh, there's some commonalities of things that uh, have occurred in other communities where police have been involved, and there is a hint of public safety as being an issue. But but really, the bottom line was uh, you know we were getting a number of complaints and. Um, at, at a city staff meeting, uh, John Fitzpatrick, our acting city manager, just said, look, you know, we need to address this issue. I want to form a, a committee. And uh, so he formed a committee of myself, understanding that there's a public safety concern to, to, the, uh, to the element of it, and that there, would, there probably was going to be some enforcement as part of whatever strategies, and, and that's where the police come in. Uh, obviously, there are some legal issues involved in that, so they are, our city attorney got involved. And, uh, and, and most frequently in these kind of things statewide and nationwide, parks is a natural fit, mm -hmm. and especially when there's public lands involved. And so uh, that's how uh, Tom Stefani and, and um, in his office got involved. And so, uh, you know, I agreed to uh, chair the committee. and. Uh, I think it showed some uh, a, a success so far in that it was a good teamwork approach from a city perspective, mm -hmm. and I think we worked real, real well. We did get other entities involved. The DNR did become involved. Wildlife specialists became involved, and we tried to involve as many of the neighbors as we could because we wanted to, to get a full understanding of what the issues were. Sure, sure. Now, you also did a workshop, um, yes. and, and that workshop um, came just, it came after we taped, but before the show aired yes, with, yes. with the neighbor ladies. Um, and so, you know, some of this may be a little bit redundant uh, for the viewers or what have you if they saw the workshop, but you, you did present a workshop, I think, on the 25th of Correct. last month of, of March. <clears throat> and um, I caught part of it. I didn't see the whole thing. But what, what kinds of, of things um, are you doing to approach this problem? It's a, it's a multi-pronged approach. Right. right? Uh, we outlined a four-step approach uh, at, the, at the meeting, and our recommendations, uh, uh, I think, tried to address the concerns of everybody in the neighborhood that, that was surveyed and that either indicated that there wasn't a problem or there was a problem. Um, 
we got a lot of input from a lot of different people and uh, talked to a lot of communities that are having the same issue and, and um, we are are different in somewhat in the way they some of the other communities dealt with it in that uh, they went right to calling the herds thinking that that was the only option well we took a little different approach based on some of the things that we were hearing and our first recommendation uh, we had a long discussion with an expert from the uh, Humane Society of the United States mm. who offered uh, to fly out their expert to, to meet with the neighbors to um, give some non-lethal options, you know, planting unpalatable plants, uh, maybe adding some fencing, some uh, commercial or homemade repellents or, or scare devices that uh, may help them to maybe change their planting patterns a little bit to make their yards a little less desirable to the deer. And we figured that we were going to take a multi-pronged you know, pronged or multifaceted approach to it and we also knew that this wasn't going to be a quick fix, you know, a, a one-time kind of option for us. This was going to be over multiple years. And we knew that eventually we would be talking about calling the herd, but we also knew we were under a timeline where now is not the appropriate time to do that. So we felt a non-lethal approach was a good option to try. And so uh, right now we're in the midst of... Uh, trying to organize the date when that expert can come out. We've put out some emails to all the residents in the area uh, in the last couple of days, and we're trying to get some feedback as to what Saturday might work out. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to bring in the expert and have a workshop. And, hey. and uh, we're going to videotape it, hopefully, mm -hmm. maybe put it uh, you know, on, on the city's media services or, or whatever so that it can maybe be something utilized community-wide. And then we'll chart our, our progress, the success of that, to see if that, if the implementing that strategy has, has done anything to help with that. I, uh, while that's going on, and, and you know, I guess I'm reporting it here for the first time at the uh, next Tuesday's council meeting on the 22nd, uh, we have, uh, we're going to be forwarding the second part of our recommendation, and that's a deer feeding ban ordinance. Mm -hmm. And so we've adopted some language uh, for a deer feeding ordinance ban. No ban currently at all? There is no ban currently, okay. correct. There are some DNR regulations, okay. and this kind of uh, matches somewhat the DNR regulations, although we're, we're making the language a little specific to what we've been seeing happen in the neighborhoods. And so the first reading of that ordinance uh, will be at Tuesday night's meeting on, on the 22nd. Of April. Can you share a little bit about the specifics of it with us? Yeah, I've, I've brought a copy of actual uh, of some of the language that, uh, and, and if I can, I'll just I'll just read some sure, of it. The proposed sure. ordinance would make it unlawful for any person to feed deer within the city of Oshkosh. It would create a rebuttable presumption that quantities of salt, grain, fruit, or other types of feed in amounts greater than one half gallon at a height of less than six feet off the ground is for the purpose of feeding deer. The six foot height requirement is based on a height that is believed deer could reasonably reach to feed and would allow the placement of greater amounts in a bird feeder at a height greater than six feet for those who enjoy feeding songbirds. Uh, and this is a, basically a summary. It'll be, it'll be put out in, in legalese. But the ordinance would also create a presumption that amounts of any quantity in a feeder type of device would be presumed to be for the purpose of feeding deer. And what we've seen are some of these uh, long troughs that are, you know, maybe two feet off the ground that are obviously for deer. Um, this is a rebuttable presumption so that it, it, uh, if that was not the intent of the feeding device, the person could come forward and show that this was not the intent. Also, we would specifically exempt unmodified commercial bird feeders or their equivalents so that those would not fall under this presumption. In addition to exempting bird feeders, we would uh, exempt naturally growing vegetation, including gardens and deer feeding as authorized by the council on a temporary basis for deer management purposes. So we, you know, we took somewhat of what the deer, DNR regulations of heights, how much, de how much of the food is there, and how it's placed in, in a, obviously, you know, salt blocks and things like that sure. are obviously for deer. <clears throat> And so this is drawn up in legalese that will be presented before the council first reading. They won't act on it. Uh, and then at the May 13th meeting, um, we intend to have the second reading where the council will act on it. 
And then at that time, we're going to have a formal resolution to the council to uh, uh, put forward this four-step approach for them to uh, take some action on. Enforcement and penalty on the proposed ordinance. Well, the penalty, uh, the dollar amount is, uh, I, I don't recall exactly what the dollar amount on there, but enforcement would be shared by both the police department and the health department. Okay. Uh, it, it will fall under a section of Chapter 6, which is our animal ordinances. So uh, there's dual enforcement of that chapter already. So uh, we sat down with uh, the legal and, and health department, and we came to an agreement that it makes sense for us to continue to enforce it that way. Going to promulgate it by signs? Yeah, I think that yeah. that's going to be part of the discussion. And uh, obviously it will, it will be advertised, what, you know, whatever the council decides, they may alter our language a little bit, but ultimately when we come up with something, it will be published, and, and uh, particularly in the problems that we're, you know, in the areas that we are having problems, I think signage would be appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, now the fines, Chief, um, w will they kind of be somewhat um, in line with the duck feeding and the, or the goose feeding? Yeah, it'll fall, that? it'll fall right in line with that. I just don't recall exactly what that dollar amount is, mm -hmm. but yeah, it would, it would be said. And then obviously, um, you know, there would be some judgments as to whether to fully invoke, you know, the ordinance at first contact. I think ultimately you try and get compliance and you make some of the same decisions sure. about whether to cite based on, you know, compliance levels and things like that. And then, uh, and so we're moving forward on the second phase, which is the, the deer feeding ban. And then thirdly, we're researching uh, grants that are available through the DNR. That you mentioned some possibilities in your... Um Workshop. Yes, yeah. and, and uh, it, it, it seems like Oshkosh is a fit and that we would mm -hmm. qualify for that. Um, and of, of course there is somewhat of a match, but we're trying to reduce the obligation, you know, to the taxpayers obviously mm -hmm. and costs like that. So we're going to really seriously explore the, the, the grant opportunities and apply for that. And there is a deadline. Um, last year's deadline was the beginning of December, which follows very nicely in our right. timeline. And then fourth, uh, the fourth step to that would be the, the calling of the, of the deer herd. And, and that, uh, there is some ongoing discussions with that yet as to exactly how that's going to occur. Uh, our recommendation the night of the workshop was that we utilize the, the services of the urban wildlife specialist, which is a, a group out of Spring Green. Uh, that's what they do. Many communities that we researched and talked with uh, utilize this group. Uh, they, they are very well trained, they have a high safety record, and of course mm -hmm. safety is my primary consideration. And uh, they come with liability insurance, and they uh, do the things that, uh, just, th that just sound reasonable and appropriate. Uh, and so there are all sorts of things that we need to do in preparation for that uh, between now and, and what would be the appropriate time for calling would be January or February of next year. There's snow on the ground, the snow cover, which um, is mandatory in order for that uh, calling to occur. Um, what complicated this issue for us a little bit here in the city, unlike many of the other communities that we looked at, was there's no public land really where this problem is. And so we spent a lot of time in our discussions with the stakeholders in that area to try and figure out where would be the most appropriate place to do a calling of the herd if that were to occur, and um, uh, you know who, who would grant us permission, where is the safest place to do it, how much land is needed, and, and that kind of thing. And um, uh, many of the, the, the business people, the, com the commercial property there, or the, the state-owned property, uh, Talking about the National Guard, the National Falcon Guard Falcon. Armory, and the and Falcon were really the Vulcan were really the two biggest right. areas. Um, Vulcan, w which uh, w were very uh, good players in this, very cooperative, had some unique circumstances in that they, uh, um, in their entity, if we were going to go on their property, we, uh, anybody that was going to participate in the in the calling would have to. Uh, go through a lot of steps in training and safety and regulations that they have, which uh, would not have had to occur on any other property. So we really focused our efforts on the National Guard Armory, and and the the people there were were phenomenal and and uh, understood the issues in the community, wanted to be good neighbors and good partners with the neighborhood there, and and ultimately. Uh, 
indicated to us that they would allow us or people on our behalf to come on their property if we had a good plan in place. And I believe we do have a good plan in place. When we're ready to implement that plan, we'll work out the legal contracts and things that need to be done. But um, I, I think uh, this is a multifaceted approach. It needs to combine lethal and non-lethal options. And I think our plan is a good one. And I hope it's, it's something that uh, can be utilized in some fashion in other areas of the city that obviously are experiencing some of the same problems. Just kind of a follow up question to the culling of the herd. Um, what what will be done with these deer once they are deceased? Yeah. Well, that's the 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 sort of the undecided portion of this yet. That we certainly are open to some of the suggestions that were made to us during the workshop. Um, our recommendation was, and 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 the option that most of the other communities use is that once the before we even get to that point, we established a community list. Of people that would be interested in taking the deer carcass once the the, the the culling started and most communities looked at that and we felt sort of the same way that this was kind of a payback to the community and the taxpayer then because there will be a certain amount of taxpayer money used for it and so uh, we thought that that might be a good gesture and so we would establish a list and once the culling occurs then we would call those people you know first first come first serve they would they would get the uh, deer carcass uh, we also have explored the option, and it was presented to us again at the workshop, of uh, uh, using some of the food pantries in the community. Mm -hmm. and, That's and, what I was thinking. And that, uh, you know, that would be a good way to, f to feed some of the less uh, fortunate in, in, in th those processes. That does add to the cost because there are food processing costs, but we're in the process right now of talking to a lot of those pantries to see, um, you know, the meat processing places you know whether they would donate their mm -hmm. time to do that and, and present that and we don't do know a number of them have done those kind of things in the past well that that's exactly what i was thinking and i bet you they well i don't know that i should bet anything here but um i would think that as a gesture of goodwill and it's a tax write-off for them if they're donating their professional services you know they can get the mm -hmm. tax benefits and and um do a gesture of goodwill at the same time yeah. and help stock some of the food pantries. I, I think it's a win-win-win all the yeah. way around. Yeah, <laughs> and we certainly will continue to look at those and, and any other options that come in and, and uh, we, you know, that, that will all become part of the final recommendations in the plan mm -hmm. that we submit when, uh, you know, January or February of next year when the calling starts. Um, but of course, uh, it, it has to, to uh, be finalized with, at the City Council on, on May 13th in some fashion, but we will have to be bringing these back in steps, uh, you know, between now and, and January of next year for, sure. for Council approval. So we, these are, there's still work to be done. Yeah, you you must issue. have been pleased with the workshop and the reception. It was very well done. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate that. It was a lot of work that went into it, and, and I think the, the benefit to that was we we had a lot of differing opinions and we tried to listen to them all and, and consider all of those things when we made our recommendation. And, and um, I really hope that uh, it becomes a model for, for other you know, issues within the community as far as urban deer problems. Has there been much opposition to it? It was hardly, there really wasn't any at the workshop. Yeah, well, we, we, we tried to deal with that before okay. it got to that point okay. in, in, in the listening sessions that we did. And I think our multifaceted approach to it uh, is, is, it shows, I think, that we listen to all sides and that we just didn't come in and say, as many communities that we talked to did, just said, the only way we think is going to solve this problem is by calling the herd and we're not going to listen to any other options and that's all we're going to do. And uh, the many communities have been doing that for a long time. It's been very successful and people have grown to accept that as a, a, a normal course of business. But uh, we, we felt that, you know, there were enough differing opinions that what would it hurt to try some of these other things? Your and timing was different in the year, too. That's true. Made, huh? That's true. Yeah. And Which yeah. made it like plants coming up just now. That's right. Um, so it worked really well for that four stages. That's right. And so uh, <coughs> we'll try it and see, and see what happens, and we'll monitor the success and, and, um, and, you know, see where we go from here. 
the um, National Humane Society of the United States, are, are they charging the city anything for that? Or no. Or that's just they're something that they're doing that is part of their mission, I guess, if you Well, know. yes, they felt very strongly that, uh, uh, and actually applauded our efforts in trying to implement some non-lethal strategies. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's what they stand for. Sure. And, and as we continue to discuss uh, some of those options with them, uh, they agreed to at their cost, send out uh, an expert, uh, Sandy Baker is her name, that uh, is more prevalent in the East Coast and has had some success in some communities there where they've set up non-lethal strategies. And um, I'm not real sure at what phase she usually comes in, but they thought it, w it might be a very good fit for us. Um, and, uh, and of course, they're picking up the cost of flying this expert out and putting on a seminar. Now. Um, you know, part of the recommendations that she's going to make to the residents there will, you know, require the residents to spend as much or as little as they want to to implement some of these non-lethal strategies in their yard. And, and I guess part of why we included that as a recommendation is we do, we do feel there was a little bit of sharing of responsibility and mm -hmm. that homeowners maybe should accept a little bit of that. Certainly, we, we're, we're not we want that to be reasonable costs, not sure. unreasonable costs, whatever they want to do. But we think maybe changing behaviors at the resident level may also help, in addition to calling the herd, change the patterns of the deer and, and you know, prevent a lot of that damage. And so uh, that particular facet of our approach uh, will, will, will not be any cost to the city. Excellent, excellent. Now, there are, in the workshop, other possible deer problem areas in the city. Yes. Could you kind of go into that a little bit? Well, uh, <laughs> we learned through this whole process <laughs> yeah. that, you know, there was a little bit of that me too, me too response where uh, we know that in um, on the north, in the north side of the city, particularly around the prison area and in those mm -hmm. neighborhoods, uh, we're seeing uh, an abundance of deer there mm -hmm. and, and problems starting to surface. South of the, of the Osborne Ave area and the airport, uh, mm -hmm. Whitman Field area and the neighborhoods to the south of that have experienced okay. deer. And um, this particular area of Osborne Ave is, is a fairly large and significant area that you can see the patterns of the penetration of the deer into the neighborhoods. And, um, but as our chart showed, uh, we've had 43 car deer crashes mm -hmm. uh, between 2006 and to date in 2008. And they've been all over the city. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've had them on New York Avenue, on Algoma, and so uh, we know that uh, on occasion we see deer running all over the place. <laughs> so um, it isn't it isn't necessarily isolated to the Osborne Ave <coughs> area, although that's the most visible and seems to get the most attention. Um, I want to bring up rabbits, and, and I and I want to do uh. it seriously because. Yeah. Rabbits are a problem in the city. Sure. Is it illegal to shoot and trap rabbits in the, in the city of Oshkosh? I'm not a DNR expert. My okay. understanding is it's it's not illegal to trap rabbits. Uh, it is illegal to transport them and and drop them off on a property without the owner's permission. Okay. Say, for instance, you trap them in your yard, you couldn't release them in South Park. Okay, I couldn't uh, take them to Cheryl's house. You couldn't, unless you got Please, permission I, from I, Cheryl. I, no, you won't have permission. I have enough rabbit problems as okay. it is. Okay. <laughs> but can you just take them out on a country road and let them go? I mean, they'll... Not according to the <laughs> DNR, you need to have permission to where they're being released. Um, hmm. Now, I, I've heard differing opinions and okay. I don't know okay. for sure. Uh, I've been told by, uh, you know, by some within the, the wildlife area that if you trap a rabbit, uh -huh. you can dispatch that rabbit within the trap. Yeah. You can't, however, shoot a firearm in the city, and, yeah. and so... Um, so that part of our you in the garage, you're really... Yeah, you probably to should <laughs> just not, not deal with that. Yeah, yeah, okay. But it is a problem, and it it is a problem. there is no... Yeah you know, natural way of, of right. you know. It's a big problem. Yeah. It kind of, kind of, if I can, kind yeah. of just, uh, you can see where this, it, it tends to take a life of its own. And, uh, in fact, within the last day or two, I, get, I received an email from a, uh, from a resident that uh, was complaining about that same thing, okay. about rabbits and let's do something about rabbits. And, uh, <laughs> and but then was saying, but the natural predators in the sky, the, the hawks and the, 
the, the falcons uh -huh. need to be contained too because they're also <laughs> taking my songbird. So I guess, you know, where, yeah, where you does could, it end? You could have a full-time job you on could, this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, real quickly, because we're almost out of time here. We've only got like about three and a half minutes left. But a um, couple of things. NBC26 reported the other night, a um, couple nights, three nights ago, I guess, as we taped this, that some of the cost for the overtime with officers, both from the police department and I believe the fire department too, is being borne by the taxpayers in the city. Now, that was never my understanding from hearing our acting city manager. And I spoke with him tonight. I saw him here in the building uh, before we started taping. And he confirmed again that no, that is in fact not the case, correct. that the taxpayers have to pay any of this. That's correct. And that, that is correct. Right. right. I'm not sure where the source of that story came and, and how it, it, it was reported that way, but you are correct and the, and the taxpayers are not funding any of the costs of the uh, police fire and, and services that uh, were needed for the movie. The, the, the movie people are very professional uh, people that have done this, uh, you know, all over and, and uh, have picked up the cost of everything. Um, they came in with a lot of requests and, and of course the city staff were trying to do what we can to make this a success and so far it has. Mm -hmm. And so the costs of taking down lights in preparation, taking down signs, uh, each department head had to submit preliminary figures of what those costs would be in manpower and expenses, uh, including uh, our police staffing for security that has gone very well. Um, and uh, and uh, we made sure through our city attorney's office that we submitted a preliminary bill of our costs to the movie uh, uh, authorities, the movie people, and they've already made deposits to cover what we believe will be our costs. And we do have an agreement that if our actual costs go over, we will resubmit an invoice and they agree to pay it, uh, and that any amount under what we've already been paid you know, we will return back to them. So okay. there will be no taxpayer uh, money used for the production. Okay. And one other thing real quickly, there was a letter to the editor um, in the paper on today, April 17th. Somebody got a ticket um, <laughs> for parking on a city street. They were down by the movie site mm -hmm. waiting to see something. Mm -hmm. And um, it was about 4.30 in the morning, I guess. Mm -hmm. And um, According to their letter, they got a ticket um, by one of the CSOs, I'm assuming. Um, very upset about it. They thought that just a simple warning would have been sufficient, and sure. they said they would have moved on their way. You and I talked a little bit about this, and, um, you know, there, there is an appeal process in sure. place, and, and this person should probably just go and appeal the ticket and see what happens. I would highly recommend that they do that. Uh, we have relaxed our two-to-five enforcement. I'm not sure of, of, of how that happened or what happened there. Uh, for the last week or so, we have relaxed overnight parking in anticipation of, you know, the crowds that mm -hmm. would be gathering and, and, uh, and, and hopefully to prevent some of the parking issues that we would be having. I certainly would encourage uh, this writer to uh, come in and use our mm -hmm. appeal process, which, which would mean just bringing the ticket into uh, the police department, filling out a form with an explanation of why they don't believe the ticket is appropriate, and that will be... Uh, uh, return to the issuing officer for review and a supervisory review of the of the, of the ticket, and so I would str I would strongly encourage the person to do that. All right, very good. Well, thanks so much for being here. Hey, I thanks. wish we had more time yeah. to cover a few of the things, but um, we'll have you back. Ah, I'd <laughs> welcome the opportunity right. to come back. Terrific. Thank you so much. We're going to take a very short break. When we come back, we'll be joined by uh, Reverend Gerald Nerenhausen um, from uh, Jericho Ministries um, to talk about uh, food pantry issues, ironically enough, and, <laughs> uh, and a few other things. So we'll be right back. I escaped. I escaped. By foot. Run across, aborted. I couldn't practice my religion. I was put to work in the forced labor camps. If I stay in Kuwait, I would have been dead by now. If you think differently, then you're an enemy. If you know how to read and write, you're dead. You speak your mind, you're dead. The only way to express what I wanted to do was to get out. I got to the country when I was about 14 years old. I was 20. I was 24. I came here with nothing. No money, no English. America stood for freedom, it stands for freedom, and that's why all my generation, young generation, wanted to be there. For the first time, I felt like I have a right 
to be on this earth. Here, you can do whatever you want to do. I love my life here. I feel at home. I'm free to do what I want. Freedom to me means my life. <laughs> How you doing? Hi. Hi. Have a nice day. You too. Thanks. If only child abuse were this easy to recognize. If you even suspect abuse, call 1-800-4-A-CHILD. All calls are anonymous and confidential. Trust your instincts. Poor nutrition today will increase Sarah's chances of anemia, add to her health care costs, sick days, even stunt her ability to learn. And the thing is, Sarah's not even born yet. Get proper nutrition before it's too late. Call or visit WIC. WIC provides nutrition information, health care referrals, even food. Your child has you, and you have WIC. Welcome back to the second half of Ion Oshkosh, and uh, we're very pleased to be joined now by Reverend Gerald Narenhausen. Now, for years, uh, Reverend Narenhausen was the senior pastor, I think probably the only pastor at Zion Lutheran for a, long for time. a while, for, Off and on for a long time, yeah. yeah. Um, and now I'm retired, though. I want you to know that. You are <laughs> retired, and uh, but but you're still very active oh, yeah, in things yeah. in the community, uh, charitable and ecumenical, uh, uh, both. And um, one of them is the local food banks you're involved with, and also Jericho Ministries. Yes. which, uh, you know, if we have some time, I want to talk to you a little bit about, uh, about to. that, too. Um, so um, you actually approached me in church one day uh, about coming you here You mean tonight. we met in church? <laughs> you don't remember that? <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you did. And, and so you wanted to come on and, and talk about some things going on with the food bank. So why don't we start there? Um, you know, is there, there's more than one food bank in town, correct? There's quite a few of them. There's which one are you involved with? I'm with the Lutheran Food Pantry on Division Street. Okay, all right. And then there's Father Carr and the Salvation Army okay. and the Ecumenical, and there's a, a five or six more or something like that. Why do we have so many? You know, I mean, wouldn't isn't that kind of pitting one against the other? Would it be not more beneficial to just have one big food pantry to serve the people, or or is there some method to the well, madness here? Philosophically. I think it's better to have more than one. Now, we may have too many, so the answer is yes and no, and no and yes and whatever. I, th I think we can have too many, but I think the idea of having two or three is, it, like in anything else, it's nice to have uh, two bakeries, or three stores, or four bars, or something. We've <laughs> so, got you a lot more than the four, <laughs> don't we? <laughs> I just say, <laughs> we may have too many, but it's <laughs> nice to have, I think, more than one, because we do something and we try something, and then pretty soon the other guy says, hey, that's working, let's us try that. And they invent something, and, and I think it's the old American custom to have a couple. And, and I think we can put them all together with all this new electronics stuff. You know, I think we could, what, what are you doing and you're serving so, so the people can't uh, double dip. Mm -hmm. And yet, I, I you should, we should be against double dipping a little bit, but don't make a passion out of trying to catch people. Mm -hmm. It's it's kind of hard to be poor, I think. Mm -hmm. you know? Oh, I agree. And I'm and sure and sometimes is. these people don't do it because they're cunning or devious or anything like that. But there's this, they're in a bind, and they they can't get enough from this one, and they so they go to the other one, and <laughs> and and you know I I don't. I think we should try to keep it to a dull roar, but not. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't try to eliminate the whole thing because you're going to get go nuts trying to do sure. that. Well, well, that's an interesting yeah. question. How would you regulate going from one pantry to another? Well, I, I, like I say, I think with electronics we can do that. Okay. With because with these computers and once we get the Wi-Fi in, in Oshkosh, yeah, for the whole city, the citywide you know, Wi-Fi, we'll, yeah, we'll we'll know all over the place okay. who's coming here and who's coming there, and and you can. I think we can handle that electronically look at what we do with education these days mm -hmm. we have all this long distance learning so you can be in alaska and be taking a class at w o u w o here and 
And so, I mean, there's no limit to what you can do on that kind of a thing. Sure. We don't all have to be, it's like having everybody in the same church. You know, everybody doesn't go to McDonald's, for heaven's sakes. The, the worst thing that McDonald's did was not invent Wendy's. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they should have invented Wendy's, and, and, and then they'd had the current on everything. Can I tell you a secret? They did. Sure. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. I have a question here, Reverend, as far as um, the, the limits, if you will, on what people can do. So if they go to one food pantry, are they disallowed then from getting any services from any other food pantry or can they only get a certain amount of food per month and they can get it from different pantries? How does that work? I don't know. I Because I don't go to all of them. Mm -hmm. I, I know that some of them have bags of food in the back room someplace and if you need something the secretary goes and gets a bag of food and say here mm -hmm. and they have different bags and you can get into different things you can buy 20 pounds of something from what we do we run ours like a little store we have you, have you ever been to our place no i have not we have well it's not real fancy you know but it's uh, uh we try to keep That's the floor swept and, the and, and, <laughs> and the and the latrines a little bit clean you know but we have some we have uh walk-in cooler uh, freezers and a walk-in cooler and we have shelves that we can kind of keep track of and we run it like a store we put out all the stuff we got on shelves mm -hmm. and the people come in and we try to limit we have little signs around that say one per family uh, if, if the, one for every two people in the family or something mm -hmm. so we try to scatter it around a little bit but uh, we have a great supply of stuff well last month we get got rid of 11 11,500 pounds last month wow March yeah well, that was the, the month before we only got rid of 8,000 yeah. pounds, but... Uh, and how many people, w do you have re statistics on how many people that was? I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> 274, <laughs> she, she tells me that that, that represented 274 families. Wow. Now, we, we don't, we, we're open one day a month okay. where they can come and shop. And we have buggies like you go around in a, in a vessel of food for Sure. And you go around there. And then when we, when we bought this old warehouse, they needed to you stay in there another month. And they said, what's it going to cost to stay another month? And I said, it isn't going to cost you anything, but I want that scale. And in the corner was a floor scale. You know, one of those that sunk yeah. in the floor. And it was broke. The guy says, give it to you. So I took it all apart and it had a lot of wax on it because that was a candle thing over there. And I took a torch and I melted all the wax off and washed it all up good. And one of the pieces was broken. I got a guy to weld it, and then I filed all the, 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 the point. You know, it, it, it's one of those tippy things. That, right. and, it, and so I put it all back together again and put a little clock oil on it. And then I got the uh, guy from um, the Weights and Measures. Mm -hmm. My scale was a half a pound off on 100. I thought that was pretty good. Absolutely. You're but a preacher and a mechanic. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, we don't use it to, to weigh out stuff, but it, it's a way of keeping control of our inventory. Sure. So when the Boy Scouts give us food, we can tell them we got 6,235 pounds of food from you. Or we get, uh, some church gives us, and we can tell them, thank you for the 300 pounds. And, so we, and then when we weigh out, it's a double beam scale so that they can <laughs> we have the carts and we know what the cart weights are so when it's all set to that thing so they come in with a cart and they come over some of our people get 150 pounds of food hmm. and they pick what they want kind of so that we don't try to well okay you get all of this canned milk or something today so they pick what then some people get some of our people have six kids or something like that in it. And there, it's a whole, it's no race, creed, or color there. And so they come in and get food and, and we just weigh it out to them. And if they can help, if they can make a little donation for it, uh, they can, if they don't, they get it anyhow. Uh, Reverend, you mentioned the Boy Scouts. Yeah. And, and I know that they do a food drive every, yes. every year. Yeah. Um, and now, does the food that they collect 
does that sort of get divvied up amongst yeah. the various food pantries? Well, well, they divvied up. They they do it different. But the last couple of years, what they kind of say is this: instead of taking it down to some place and then resorting it, they say that all the people that bring in food from this area around here will go to Zion's food, to the Lutheran food pantry, and this will go to Father Carr and that. So I, we have no idea of what everybody gets because they just kind of arbitrarily say from this area. And then the little Boy Scouts run around and they pick up cars and they come over and, and dump it in the, in, the, in the food pantry over there. And then we weigh it out and sort it out and put it up in the shelves and stuff like that. Do you get support from United Way for the pantries? No. None of the pantries? In now you ask two different questions. Okay. <laughs> All right. Starting with your your operation does not get any I don't, money. We don't. No. Okay. And now you don't know whether I wouldn't turn one. it down, but yeah. they haven't. Oh, Have you applied? I don't think so. Uh -huh. I think I've talked years ago. I kind of talked to them a little bit about it, but they got so many things going now yeah. that they can't. You think and food would be a good basic United Way? Well, I'd like to have one of those from the from the foundation. You know, they're always throwing money around. Oh, like from the, the community foundation. The foundation. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to have some. <laughs> have, you ever, have you ever approached them? No, I haven't. Uh -huh. I, I'm a beggar, but I'm not maybe the best beggar in town. Okay. I mean, I, I don't know how to do it with them. You know, I don't know what the thing is. Uh -huh. But um, like a formal application, maybe. Yeah, just, formal application. Yeah. These are all. I they always want to know this and that, and sometimes I don't know what to say. But they know who we are. Sure. And if they like we get, there's a, there's a, a, a foundation in Milwaukee that uh, gives money to the Amro Food Pantry, like twenty or $30,000. Hmm. Siebert Foundation, and then, they, then we get a share of that. But they share it with a lot. It's a Lutheran outfit down there. But they buy a lot of food, and, and we get Boy Scouts, and we get we just got a big donation from Miles Kimball. We get something from Thrivent, and then the Roundies, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, would you like to hear another part of the story? Sure, absolutely. Uh, I just put an offer to purchase the Ford building up on Murdoch Street. The old Reset Ford? The uh, Reset Ford. Really? Okay. The Ford. The reason for this is we have a little store. Um, or not Reset, I'm sorry. Dave Yakum Ford. Yakum Ford, yeah. Yep. Well, it was Reset yep. and Yakum and yep. Dahl and whoever. Yeah. We, in order to raise money, I started the little thing called Job's Closet. It's over on, oh, on, Sawyer, on, on Street. Sawyer Street. And uh, we're, we're able, if we're real frugal, we give $500 a month to the food pantry. I'd like to raise that to $1,000 a month or maybe a little more. Uh, but I, only, I got... I think I got 5,000 square feet of floor space there. Now, whether my logic is right, but I figure if I can get a bigger floor space, I'll take in, I'll give, get more money. And so we made an offer to purchase that. And so that will go from five or 6,000 square feet to pretty close to 10,000 square feet. Hmm. And uh, then uh, we'll use some of that. Maybe I'll start a little daycare up there and I'll move my office up there we see we own that building on Sawyer Street now, mm -hmm. and I'll sell that or use it for something else. So, I think, I think I can make it. I know it's a little creativity and a little bit of pushing and shoving and grunting and whatever. But I, you know, we've done things like that before, and if you don't, if we fail, well, we just sell it to somebody else. Sure, absolutely. I'm thinking of the numbers you gave me of the eleven thousand pounds and the two hundred and seventy-five families for yeah. just one month. Can you kind of talk in more general terms? How, how bad, how serious is poverty in this city? How many people, do uh, you have any sense of numbers? How would you like this for sense? Okay. I started out 20 years ago by carrying a couple bushel baskets in the back of my station wagon. Now I got 11,000 pounds. That's five and a half. That's almost six ton. Uh -huh. Now I have a truck. We bought a, an old Wisconsin Public Service truck. And we go out to, to uh, the food pantry sometimes twice a week. Okay. We buy food out there. Uh, most, most of our food comes from the food pantry at 20 cents or what something like that a pound. 
So, and and you saw in in uh, January and February we were at like 80, 80, 7,400 pounds. In March it went to over eleven thousand. And no, that's just one food pantry that's, of the. That's the, the one on Division Street, in the seven hundred block on Division Street. We own that old warehouse over there, and uh, the food pantry is in there. And so we went up to eleven thousand. Now that's I'm running behind on that, so I'm scrounging a little bit. Yeah. And if uh, our total budget is around thirty thousand uh dollars, -huh. the biggest expense is utilities because uh -huh. we have freezers and stuff. I pay Pauline Cleveno. Pauline is my right hand bower. Okay. And uh, she's, she's, she's uncanny. Uh -huh. She knows every poor person in town. Uh -huh. I don't really need a computer. Uh -huh. I got Pauline. Uh -huh. So she knows them and she'll, what? I, I think you were over someplace else. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> she, so she, she started the food call. Oh, she's, <laughs> listen, I don't get in the way. <laughs> you know, and she, she knows, and, and, and so we have volunteers come in there. We have volunteers come in. Our f our food pantry opens for f to the poor to the public poor on the uh, the first Friday of the month. Okay. After that, you get we s we serve by by invitation. I mean, not invitation. What uh, appointment? appointment? Appointment. Yeah, okay. they come down and they call Pauline or they call me and I call Pauline okay. and and that kind of stuff. And we get rid of our biggest thing goes like eleven thousand pounds, perhaps. Let's see, do I have a thing? 7,500 pounds went out on Friday. And we got rid of another two ton during the month in bushel baskets and stuff to, laundry baskets and stuff to poor people who made it, who called and were in trouble. Well, just, and, and, and our, of course our clothing thing does another thing. Like we had, my wife was just telling me, she works at Job's Closet and we had three requests for, for clothing today, so we have a, a direct thing there. We we have, we didn't start out to do this, but we we're kind of growing like Topsy, you know. And well, you try, somebody needs this, and somebody needs that, and so we had three people come in. We gave perhaps a hundred dollars worth of our clothing away, you know. That's you know jeans at fifty cents a piece, and they're at half price. So we, you you can. Fill this table up for a hundred dollars. You know, sure. maybe half of this room. Absolutely. So you could. You know, I, I have a question for you, Reverend. As far as you know, some of these numbers and the number of families yeah. that you're servicing um, in, in a month's time, or a day's time, or a week's time, whatever it may be. Um, now, this is from the Lutheran food pantries. Yes, ma'am. So, if someone, do you serve only Lutherans? I mean, no, no, okay. no. Okay. It's I just what the Lutheran churches then do. I'm trying to organize all the Lutheran. Right, we don't have them all right now. Right. But I go to church. Now that I'm retired, I go to church on Sundays in different churches. Okay. And then. Not always on Sundays. Sometimes on Saturdays. <laughs> so, well, Saturday night. I like to go on Saturday night because you meet them. A lot of them. Us Lutherans are getting almost as smart as the Catholics. You know? <laughs> we start the Saturday night thing, you know. And and so we have, we, uh, I go and meet the people and. Sometimes they'll say, would you, would you like to say, they recognize who I am, and they say, would you like to say something about the food pantry? And I, <coughs> well, yes. Yeah, you surprise. Know? <laughs> and sometimes they don't ask me, but I, so I say something anyhow, just to the people in the, the mm -hmm. vestibule, because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm getting to be known kind of around town. Okay, so, so just to kind of understand, the, the Catholic churches gather up probably f amongst themselves their food, and that goes to their food pantry, but that may or know. may not serve yeah, everybody. It, it sorts out uh, to uh, uh, undenominational, I think. Right, exactly. And know, then the Lutheran right. churches that are involved, they'll gather up their food, and in their Lutherans can there. come there, or people who have no church base can yeah, come there. Yeah, so you don't necessarily have to be Lutheran to go to the Lutheran food pantry, or Catholic to go to the Catholic or food Salvation pantry. Army or Salvation Army to go to the Salvation Army. Yeah. Or the car has a, well, he used, car has a food. Now see, the Salvation Army cooks stuff. And car used to cook stuff, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but the rest of us just give, they give bags away. Like the ecumenical food pantry, I've never been there, so I don't really know what, mm -hmm. but I think they give bags away and, and uh, there's a couple more around town that do that. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, we kind of run it like a store, it's easy and we don't, we try not to get ripped off too badly, but 
if we do, we don't cry about it. Sure. Well, you know, good luck with the uh, the purchase of, of that old Ford place over on Murdoch, and um, you know, maybe maybe some of these um, organizations like the Oshkosh Area Community Foundation and some of these other folks. Yeah, will, right. Will hear this message and and. You know, but I would encourage you to, to apply, too. I'd like to apply know. to the city for bond money at 3.2%. Good luck with that. <laughs> 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 they gave it to the Good college. luck with that. Why would they give it to me? Get me in on that. Well, it's on worth a try. Hey, anything's little worth a try, right? I'm, I, I'm not, I, I want to let them know that I'm open to that consideration if anybody wants There you go. Oh, you're so in the right building. I'm That's in right. the right building. <laughs> <laughs> and I got the guts to do it. Yeah. So, uh, so there's all kinds of things around. And if, if we can... If, if our store will get will get bigger and the people will support the store, we, we can do this with hands down. Sure. And, and people need outlets for uh, for their elamostinary things. Is that a good word? For charitable kind sure. of things? Sure. We'll accept yeah. that word. Okay. Do you think more consolidation is needed with these food pantries or just let them be I would the think, way they are? I would think a little... A little bit wouldn't probably wouldn't hurt, but because uh -huh. I don't know where I don't know what we need to con. I don't know all of them. Sure. But tomorrow I'll meet tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. I'll meet a whole bunch of them. They're meeting at my food pantry. Okay. And uh, I've been to a couple of these things, but you really don't know unless everybody introduces everybody and they got a chart on the wall and stuff like that. So you, we try to do our thing and they try to do their thing, and uh, you know that's kind of the way it goes. Maybe a list of the food pantries and the days. I'm would sure be somebody has something a, that could be run on OCAT. Maybe somebody sure. has yeah, a list can, someplace. We can put it on I our know. website yeah. as well. Maybe somebody has a list. I don't know. Yeah. Right sure. Would you like to talk about Jericho Ministries uh, for a few minutes? Uh, we've well, got a few minutes left, I and I, I know that our uh, Jericho Road Ministries yeah. is. It started out as a committee in the church. It was just another committee, and we built some apartment houses. Well, I started building the the. Uh, Bethel Home. Mm -hmm. uh, years and years ago, I started out getting that off the ground, and then I had the uh, the first low-income housing, the Simianas up there, and then the city found out that I was getting all this stuff, so they got their own uh, housing authority, and then they took them over. <laughs> but I got I got two hundred out before they closed it down. You, you know. might be able to get some bonds from them. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you never and then know. we got well, we got then I I built. A lady come to me one day and she says, when I'm building this stuff for house, for elderly people, and she says, Reverend, you help elderly people. How about helping some of the mentally ill? I said, honey, between you and me, I don't know any other mentally ill people, you know? And she says, I'll show you. And so she took me around. And these people live in, in tragic places because they all have social workers, but the social worker are spread pretty thin too. So... Right they don't get to supervise them as, as tight as maybe they I don't want to be unkind here yeah. but we we put in so we found a, a, that the same place where you get money for housing they had money for for mentally ill and so I put in for a 15 unit mentally ill place and I got it and so we built the thing and it was full like right now and now in this thing it's, it's run just like court towers or in, uh, Simianas or anything like that. And they pay, a, 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 I don't know, 30% or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've, had, we've had people live there that didn't pay anything because they didn't have any money at all. But then they're supported by the, by the federal government and stuff like that. But you, the nice thing about it is you get to keep an in-house manager there. Now, they don't, they don't have to do anything about... Uh, they don't do treatment or anything like this, but if they if they see somebody and the word is acting out, if somebody's acting out, then they'll say they'll tell me or they'll call the caseworker or, or something like this, and we get the caseworker and say watch John mm -hmm. or whatever the name has to be. We had here's a cute thing, we had one guy that had to walk a long distance. He 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 had to go down to the social service and take a and get a a pill. They wanted to take a pill every day. So he went down there, and then they would give him $10 and watch while he took the pill. Now, over the course of the, the months and years, well, I noticed that this guy's acting kind of strange. So I went down and talked to the caseworker, and the caseworker said, yes, he's acting kind of strange here too. And as we talked, Ron, 
they have a they had a big fish tank in their office, and she says, "Do you know anything about fish?" Well, I'm a biology major. What about a fish? <laughs> well, I didn't know what the fish were dying. And right away, it, it dawned on me there's a connection between this guy coming down and these fish dying, and there was. He would go down there and get a a pill and his ten dollars, take the pill and hold it in his mouth, and as he walked past the fish tank, he would spit it in the fish tank, and the fish were dying. <laughs> so once we once we found that out, well, we, I mean, you fall into these things. But anyhow, I got. <laughs> That's a great story. I, 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 we, you run into this all the time. Anyhow, I my my contact in Milwaukee said, Rev, could you use another? place for mentally ill and I said well I don't couldn't use it but he says I got I know I can get I don't know eight hundred thousand dollars and they were giving the money away then not a mortgage the, the HUD people gave you the money all you had to do was run the thing right so I said okay let's put it in and see what happens maybe I can get another church to do this mm -hmm. I couldn't give it away <laughs> I, I had the project was all done you see I think it'd be nice if, if a couple churches would have 10 people or five people or something like that. And then I got another one, I couldn't give that, uh, then I learned, I don't do this again, you know. <laughs> so that's how we have, we have 30 apartments for mentally ill that just our church has. See, so you're getting all that money and you're, and you're concerned about filling out a little application. Did you ever deal with foundation? the HUD people? I have a lady that does that. In a sense, I She's have, She's yeah. smarter than I am in that she has a, a, a degree in business. Yeah. Nice lady, and you got to fill in all the. Uh, see, I'm not a detail person; I'm a concept person, <laughs> and I need people to fill in the blanks and check mm -hmm. off the things and stuff like that. You got to have the ideas though before you can fill it. Well, in, they, right? you got to have them both because yeah. if you just have ideas, you can get into a powerful amount of, lot of trouble. You know, so you need you need. So the two of you team up and fill out those applications. Yeah. Well, well, we'll try to do that. There you go. Um, well, we're just about out of time, so oh, I, you know, I know it, it's flown by. But um, so, if people want to donate to the food pantry, um, you're in the 700 block of Division Street. I'm assuming you could well, also. I, they should come to 429 North Sawyer. 429 North That's Sawyer. That's my office over there. Okay. There used to be a little bank building over okay. there. Okay. And, and is that where they would go if they want to apply to be a volunteer as well? If they come over there, I will see if they get to the right place. Okay, 429 North Sawyer. Yeah, that's our right. that's our office. Okay. And that's where I am, and that's where our board meets. And, and they I can have, drop food off there, I too, right? Yeah, no, okay. we'll carry right. it to where it belongs. We'll, all right. We'll do all those good things. All right. We're not proud. Well, Reverend, thank you very much, not just for being here, but for everything that yeah. you do in yeah. the community. Oh, listen, we, d we have more fun than you shake a stick at. Yeah. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks Cheryl. for coming. Hey, thank all you. Right. Thanks so much. And thanks uh, to the crew and, and to Dan and, uh, as always, to you. We'll see you next time. Until then, take good care. Keep your eye on us. We've got our eye on Oshkosh.